All right, uh, I'd like to challenge you. That's a good way to start off class, right? Challenge you to what? To a dance off. No, I'm just kidding. Hey. Uh, I'd like to challenge you as we're getting towards the end of the semester, especially as we're getting into the project. All right? And you can use these last few assignments sort of as preparation for that. And the challenge is to sort of, sort of to go the extra mile on the assignments. Um, first part of the course, again, we were learning a whole bunch of new things, and we were applying them, and we were just trying to get things to work. Now, as we're getting into more and more pages, and pages that like sort of work together, I want you to think in terms of it working, the solution that you're providing working as a unit not just individual pieces working, all right? Um, so I graded one of the labs, I think lab eight, and a lot of people had, uh, in essence, most of it done okay, but there was a few things where they like didn't dot the I's and cross the T's. Uh, for example, a lot of people skip validation. So Nicholas Cage could go to our website then, log on, and give every one of his movies 10,000 stars, right, uh, for a lot of people's applications. That would negatively affect, or not negatively affect, but that would uh, have a big impact on his overall ratings for his movies, all right? So if, it's a, if, if you're expecting only one to five, make sure it's only one to five, all right? Make sure that when you finish one activity, it takes you to another page that, where it makes sense. So after you add a review, where do you want it to go? You know, think of in those terms. And um, I try to describe what I want in the assignment, and sometimes I don't always do it completely, and that's fair. And when that's the case, some people take a different approach than I imagine, and that's fair. If I don't describe it completely, it's my fault um, for not describing it completely. But it should be that... Um, Whatever solution you come up with um, works as a complete solution and, and has a flow to it, all right? So after you log on, it goes to a logical place. After you enter a review, it goes to a logical place. Um, you should not have to pick the user ID if you are entering a review, right? Because you're logged on. It should know your user ID, all right? Here's what I was envisioning, uh, and again, my fault for not being more clear. I was expecting a logon page taking you to one of the search pages. I guess it doesn't matter which one. The search page, of course, goes to the movie detail page. Oh yeah, and the movie detail page should have not just a list of actors, right? Should have information about the movie. Because what movie did I click on? Did I click on Star Trek 1 or Star Trek 2, you know, who knows? You'll ever forget that or get interrupted or whatever. So show the movie on the top of the page. And then show the actors. What I was envisioning is you would click a button to review that movie. It would go to the review page. And the, re the movie and the user ID would already be filled out. And you'd only have to enter in the review and the number of stars. And then when you're done, it would go back to here. A lot of people interpret it differently. A lot of people, after you logged on, you went to a review page where you had a drop down for movies. And I didn't deduct if you did that because, all right, that's logical. But, um, and if it worked as a complete unit, so like maybe after, after you entered the review, it would take you to the movie page and show you the average or take you to the search page or whatever. The point is, is think of it as like a complete solution. You know, think of it as, as acting like you would want a website to act. And um, sometimes you might encounter something that you don't know how to do because maybe we haven't covered it, all right? Um, and I'm gonna show you an example of what a student did that we didn't cover some stuff in class but they took the initiative to go and figure some things out and work with me to figure some other things out. And it's really great because it, the solution really works as a unit. All right? And again, in my mind, 
and again, maybe I should be more explicit about this, this is what I mean when I say it should work and act and look like a professional website. All right? So let's bring up this example. This is an example of some good work. And again, especially think of this in terms of your project. Um, make it work in a way that makes sense. So, let me go and find the one in question. turn the projector on. through the halls, I act like they do not realize that there's actually classes in session here. It's ridiculous. It, it is. Um, and you know, sometimes it has been the early high school students, and that kind of annoys me, and I've contacted them, but sometimes it isn't. And that's almost more disturbing. Very. The one thing I should also put, too, is I should ask that everyone enter in a user ID, a mic, and a password, a password, so I don't have to go figure out what everyone's logged in as. All right? Good point. Yeah. John Cena, I think. <laughs> C3P. Yeah, exactly. It, it, if, if this would have like played the music, it would have really, it would have gotten extra credit, I'm sure. C3PO <laughs> and Cena. Funny, I don't remember these. C3PO and okay. All right, so let me go and log in. doesn't have a login. My, right. my bad. I was wondering, it's like, I'm sure I would have noticed John Cena before and made a comment, but I, uh, but that's right, this one didn't require you to log in. All right, so let's set this as a start page. There we go. Actually, let's set title by the start page. That's the better one to look at. All right, first of all, we go to search by title. What if I type something in that doesn't exist? What's the default behavior if I typed in something that didn't exist? If I did a search. It would, well, it would not show film not found. It would just show an empty data grid. In which case, the user's like left wondering like, well, what happened? Did, my, did nothing happen? Is it still thinking about it? And so on. Whereas this student went and put in Boom, no results matching your search results. Please uh, search again. Okay. That's great. Little, little extra thing. We didn't talk about this in class, <coughs> but the student went and figured some of it out, and then we talked about it, and boom, you have something that like makes this like so much better than just, um, just following the default behavior. Remember, it, it's not... ASP.NET or C Sharp that's writing the website is you. So I've mentioned before that the framework has certain default behavior. And that default behavior takes you so far. But you can always go and extend it and add to it. 
Um, if you go and type in something that is valid, all right, you get that. You can click that, see that. Notice you see the film title and, and that. One thing you could do is through formatting, you could format this to not show the date and time. And you could actually, um, um, you know, just show the date part. That's a format string that you could put in the detail view. Yes? Um, while I'm looking at it, I really struggle with that death date column because <laughs> <laughs> not all my actors were dead. Okay. And it kept throwing me this error that because there were null values, uh -huh. in, like the majority of those, that it, 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 it just blow up on me. <clears throat> and I even tried to go in like the edit columns okay. uh, thing, and, and there was like um, it was something like what you would put in there if the value was null. Right. I, I would just try to type it like not applicable, just so it had something to show right. and it still didn't work. Well, we could take a look at your specific thing. Um, I, I can show you what I would, you know, how it, it probably should work. And then we can we can take a look at, at your specific okay. one because it shouldn't give you that problem. Yeah, because I, I thought I didn't think it would be such a big yeah. problem, but isn't that how it is though? Yeah. Like you know you can you can put together a query in ten seconds, but like one small little thing takes you hours to research. That's not atypical of programming. There's no programmer's joke that says you know you spend eighty percent of your time working on eighty percent of the functionality. And the other 20% takes the other 80% of your time, you know. So um, it is true that you spend more time sometimes on these little bitty details than you do maybe on some main piece of functionality. But the rewards are big because you end up with a site that really looks good. All right. Um, this one was another thing. What if we type in something here? <laughs> Then we type in nothing. Now this is going to give us a client side error. All right? And therefore, it would not automatically refresh the grid view. All right? Because it's giving us a client side error. But if we click search here, there's actually JavaScript code that blanks out that. All right, so it's a kind of mix of JavaScript and so you don't give misleading results. All right, now again, little things, little things. I know we didn't cover them in class, but the student looked at it and says, you know, to make my solution work the way I want it to, I'm going to spend a little extra time and try to put these in. And that makes all the difference and really elevates your application. So I'm challenging you all to think of that. So if it's something we haven't done, that's fine. Bring it to my attention in lab or, or ask questions about it in class. And I'll be glad to take a look at it. Now, for your specific issue of the actor, let's go and look. Um, that would be on this page, I imagine. Oh. Um, that's a Word document. Okay. Film database. That's... Actor page, there you go. Right, we'll try the actor page. <coughs> All right, we should be able to go and do this. Edit columns. And for death date, we should have a null display text. And that, yeah, that's what I tried to yeah. put in. Not dead yet. <laughs> that's funny. I don't think it's funny. I mean, I guess it is, you know. If... And then it says it like that. Yeah. So we can fill that in. Now, as far as the formatting of dates, I don't remember how to do that. But I know there's someone in the room that does know how to do that. And what that what's that person's name? It's Google. Google. All right. So Google ASP.NET Grid View Format Date Without Time. It's funny when I see these Google queries, and I almost think, like, are these things that people in my class put in? 
Because you'll see things that clearly look like they're from an assignment. All right? I need to, I need to, uh, I need to generate a Fibonacci series, and you know, it's like something that, like, wait a minute, no one in a business is going to be doing that. that you know, this is your math class, isn't it? All right, date format without time in ASP.NET. Blah 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 blah. Date format string. You can specify the format in an eval statement. Uh, this would be if we were writing the code. We should be able to copy this in to here. Into the date format string. Shows just a day. All right, it is really it, it's really hard sometimes when you've been working on something to approach it with a fresh set of eyes and approach it like a user would. All right, because what is a user likely to do? Almost anything. Right. So there's a box that says enter a rating zero to five. You know that you're only supposed to put a zero to five in. So guess what? You're only going to put zeros to five in. Well, you have to think. Well, <coughs> what if some user types in the word five? What if someone types in a million? You know, you have to be able to handle all those things. That's why it's good sometimes to let someone else look at, at what you've done, uh, and they can help uh, spot some problems, and they can help uh, show you where uh, the flow of the page may or may not uh, uh, be logical. Because it makes sense to you. I'm sure it does. But to make it more usable where it's it's clear for everyone, all right, is, is sort of the goal. All right, so that's my challenge, especially for the project and for any remaining assignments that you do. You know, consider this like if this was sports that were moving into the playoffs, where you got to up your game a little bit. All right? Because Steph Curry is going to be in the lab trying to block your code or steal your code or something. All right. Okay. So on to our next example. And again, I think it's always a good idea to um, take inventory uh, to, to sort of describe the example and, and in a sense design it. All right. And where I talk about what we want everything to do, and then we sort of like take a mental inventory of what we've done before and what we haven't done before. All right? So, here's ultimately what I want to do. And again, we probably won't get to all of this today. But we'll continue this on Monday or Tuesday. Hey, Mr. <coughs> Sellers? Yes. Yeah, I want you to know. Um, yes, I was telling her yesterday I ran into a problem similar to hers. I was trying to make web pages for the the movie, the movie work I did, and I kept running this problem, and it kept telling me, this is unrecognized, that's unrecognized, that's unrecognized. Okay. Did you figure it out? No. Nope. All right. Well, you should probably email me the question or bring it to lab. I can do that. All right. Sounds good. We're going to enter an order uh, in our, uh, for, uh, we're going to enter a new order, all right, um, for uh, pizzas. All right. Um, let me let me think this through. All right. Tell you what, we'll save that one. We'll rewind. You know, I had this all clear in my head, and just as I was about to say it, I thought of an issue. Well, I'll tell you what. We will go, and we'll go and we'll start this one. We'll enter a new order. 
So we, I need an order table. <coughs> And I'm going to want the customer name. I'm going to want the customer address, city, state, zip. I'm going to want this to say the type of order. And right now we're going to have two choices. We're going to have pickup or delivery. All right. Then I want the date, time that the order was placed. start with that. That's sort of the first pass. I then after I insert all right after I insert displays the order information. This is John Doe's order. And has a screen to add a pizza to the order. So, type of pizza. And the size. Small, medium, and large. Then we'll insert. Here, I want to see a list of all the pizzas on that order. And I want to be able to edit and delete. All right, so first page I take the general order information. The second page I go and add pizzas to that order. All right, then when I'm all done, I click a done link or button or something like that. All right, so that's ultimately what I want. All right. This is going to require us to create a couple more tables at least. All right, one at least, but actually I'm going to create three tables. That might surprise you. All right, what do you think the three tables I'm going to create are? Four tables. These are new tables. Remember, all we got in the current table is especially pizza topping, especially pizza topping. So you don't have anything relating to orders. So I'm going to make four tables. I lied. Four tables. What do you suppose the four tables we're going to make are? Customers. Uh, I could make a customer table, but I'm actually not. I'm just going to have. I'm just going to enter in, the, in their name every time. I, I don't really care about that. But I, I could have made a customer table. But I'm just going to type in a name each time they order. Order table? I'll make an order table. It's another table that I'm going to make. So an order item or 
what we could call an order pizza table. And that makes sense, right? Because I have an order, and then I have specialty pizzas. The way we'll do it now is that we're only going to consider that we offer specialty pizzas. All right? So we're not going to worry about like a custom pizza where they say I want it with pineapple, pepperoni, and anchovies. All right? We'll just only allow them to order specialty pizzas for this example. Now, what's the relationship between these two? One order can have many specialty pizzas on it. All right? Sure. A given specialty pizza can be on many different orders. Right? Two people can order a Hawaiian pizza. And many, many, and one order can be for a Hawaiian pizza and a meat lover's pizza. So we have a many to many relationship, and therefore we have an order pizza or an order item table. This is known as like a header detail, right? Because you have one set of data for the whole order. In other words, the whole order is for this customer. And the whole order uh, is associated with this address, city, state, and zip. And the whole order is pickup and delivery. Right? You define that once. You don't say that, that you know, you don't have where, like, well, I'm going to pick up the first and third pizza, but the second pizza I want delivered. Right? That doesn't make any sense. All right? So there's header information about the order, but then there's detail about it too. When we talk about header detail, there's one header that has multiple detail rows. And in this case, the detail rows are that one order can consist of a bunch of pizzas. All right, so there can be several pizzas in the order pizza table for a given order. All right, now there's two other tables here. And these are the ones that are a little bit harder. I'm going to create a table for the type of order and the size. All right? Now, you might ask yourself, why would I create a, why would I create a type of order table? There's only two choices, pickup or delivery. Why would I go to the trouble of creating a type of order table? Well, you have to know what your order is. And you're well, going to ship out. If it's a pickup, you're not going to send it. Right, that's true. We do have to know what type of order it is. The question is, is why do I create a table? Why don't I just allow them to enter in pickup or delivery? Because I could do that, right? I could just make it a text field in the order. And not be not be a table. Just allow them to enter in the type of, of, of order, just like I would allow them to enter in the name of the customer or the whatever. Why would I make it a table? There's room for error. Pardon me. There's room for error. It, in which way there's there's room for error? They could type it wrong. Exactly. What if, if I allow them to type pickup or and, and delivery? I could have someone type in pickup. Someone type p. Someone type DEL, someone type in delivery, someone spell delivery wrong, someone have their fingers one key shifted over as they're typing and type some nonsense in. All right. Now I could validate for that. All right. I could have code in there that says, well, make sure it's either the word pickup or the word delivery. That is enforcing the constraint in the program. All right. There's two places you can put constraints on your data, all right? At least two places. One of them is within the database, and one of them is within your application, all right? Which way is better? Which place is a better place to put your constraints in? Okay, we have two vo votes. We have a, I, heard, I heard database, I heard application. Why do you say application? give you that, that's, that's a true statement. You can have the application give the user a user-friendly error. But that's 
not the same as where I'm going to enforce the constraint. Okay? So, someone said database. Okay? Why did you say database? Well, if you're going to be using your database um, in multiple applications, you only have to enforce that constraint one time. Absolutely. You may have multiple applications to allow uh, people to enter orders. What would be an example of a multiple applications to allow someone to enter the order? Um, on your cell phone and on... Exactly. You could have, you could have, a, you could have a web page where you could place an order. All right? You could have where you call into the restaurant and tell the person the order and they enter it in. All right? You could have a mobile phone application. Potentially, that's three different applications. Potentially, that's three different applications to allow the entry of an order. All right? If you enforce the, uh, the, the constraint in the application, that's three places you have to get it right. All right? And again, if we're talking about other applications and other situations, the same thing applies and the same problem even becomes bigger. All right? If you enforce a constraint in the application, somewhere, somewhere along the line, something's going to get, someone's going to get it wrong, and you're going to have bad data. What's the problem with bad data? Well, garbage in, garbage out. And again, think beyond just, you know, someone doesn't get to pick up their pizza. You know, think of more important, oh, God, what's more important than getting your pizza, all right? Think of other things in a business where it could have consequences if the data is invalid. You're not giving the right uh, information uh, to that. So, I'm going to put a table. How does that allow me to enforce a constraint? By having a table. How does that allow me to enforce a constraint by having a table? And then, so in addition to creating the tables, I'm going to create an order table, and I'm going to create a type of order table. What else am I going to do? Make a relationship. Make a relationship. And how does a relationship uh, enforce that constraint? And primary and foreign key? Right. You create a foreign key. All right. By creating a foreign key, that will ensure that I cannot put an order in that doesn't have a valid uh, type of order. So, and on the user interface side, I'm going to make a drop down. I'm going to make a drop down for type of order that, um, you know, shows that for, you know, for this, this order is pick up, this order is delivery. And that's the only two choices. All right. There's another reason for doing it in the database. What if I expand my pizza shop to allow for dining in? All of a sudden, there's a third kind of order, right? There is pick up, delivery, dine in, all right? If I built the constraint in the application, I would have to change every application to allow for that, all right? Whereas if I have it in a database table, all I need to do is go and add a table. Or, or, I'm sorry, add a row to that table to say, all right, now we have three choices, pick up, delivery, or dine in. All right? Same thing applies with small, medium, and large pizzas. You know, someone could type in S, someone could type in small, someone could type in SW or SM, someone could type in SMOL, uh, all kinds of things that someone could type in for small. All right? If I then was the manager of this place, and I wanted to get a report on how many of each kinds of pizzas we sold. All right, my, my my the report I got would be would be gibberish. Right, I'm like you know small would be listed under six different categories, and there'd be some size of pizza that I'd have no idea what it was supposed to mean. Right, so I would not get accurate information out. So I, or I wouldn't get would not have accurate data. Therefore, any conclusions I came would not be accurate. All right, so we're going to do that. I'm going to create the tables. Um, I'm going to just create the order and type of order table right now, because that's probably all we'll have a time to get to today. And then next time we'll create the order pizza table and the size table. All right.
This, by the way, the problem of having bad data magnifies that this is going to be on a public site, right? Your employees, you might be able to train them to enter the right thing in most of the time, maybe, all right? Whereas the general public, uh, they don't know. They'll just type in what they feel like. All right. So let's go and let's add a table. And I'll call it. Is order a good name for a table? Mm -mm. Probably not. Why not? Vague. Well, I don't know. I don't think it's vague so much. I think there's a more specific reason. Yeah, there's there's the order by clause in in a SQL statement. All right, so I don't want to do that. So I'll call it pizza order. All right, sounds good for a ID auto number customer name. Um, I'm going to pretend to put the address and phone number and all that in, all right, but in the interest of time, I won't do that. I'm just going to put the interesting columns in. So the customer name, that's one. Uh, the type of order, I know it's going to be in an order type table, so I'm going to call it order type ID, and it's going to be a number. Time of order. It's going to be a date time. So pretend there's a bunch of other string fields in here for um, for this. Uh, again, just in the interest of time. So I go save this. Create another table. sometimes make the mistake of um, is is keep it's a good idea in my mind to give the, your table a name and give the ID the table name followed by ID what I mean is if I call this order types I would say order types ID so I would keep it consistent so the table name matched the um, the primary key name. All right. So decide if you want to call your table singular or plural. So, specialty pizza should have a specialty pizza ID. Specialty pizzas should have a specialty pizzas ID. It's a small point uh, that comes in handy. I've written uh, report generator programs um, where you actually like. Describe the report that you want in user-friendly terms. The person can like drag and drop stuff over. And it's real convenient to know that the primary key of a table is a table name plus ID. If you can do that, that, that makes your life easier. So again, try to be consistent with that. Not done yet. I want to define a foreign key relationship between them. So I can show tables. I can add the two tables. I will enforce referential integrity. 
I'm not going to cascade updates and deletes. Um, if someone were to delete pickup or delivery, that's kind of a big thing. All right. I wouldn't want to delete orders. I would want to say, no, you can't delete that. On the other hand, if I accidentally entered in a, uh, a, a order type that was wrong and no one had placed an order of that order type, yeah, I, I can delete it. All right? So I'll enforce referential integrity. Again, it properly knows the one to many, right? One order type could have many orders associated with it. There can be a lot of deliveries, there can be a lot of pickups. But each order is only a pickup or delivery. All right? So the one to many is appropriate. All right. So let's go in, try application, and create a new page. Oh. I was talking about constraints. I would want to make this a required field. And I would want to make customer name a required field. <coughs> order type a required field. Type of order probably a required field as well. All right. So I'll make all those required fields. Again, sticking with the theme that it's better to enforce this in the database as opposed to the application. Now, to be sure, we can have validation in the application, all right, so that um, the validation happens client side and says, hey, you have to enter in a customer name for this, all right. So, yeah, that doesn't mean we're going to skip it in the validation in that. But sort of the fail safe is that even if you screw up the validation uh, in your application, the database constraints will make sure that only good data is entered. So let's go in here and let's make a, uh, a page to insert into the order table. So I'll go to File, New, File, a web form. ASPX, place code in separate file, definitely. Select master page, should be. I wish I would have done this in this application, right, because we should have a consistent master page uh, for all these. Um, and I'll click add. Now we have to decide, you know, is this going to be a public site where anyone can enter an order, or is this uh, like something that's going to run for uh, the employees only? I'm just going to let, I'm just going to make this a public page so you don't have to be logged on to access this. Uh, if you could imagine, if we did have a log on with a user ID, um, we could fill in the customer information and allow them to change it if they wanted to. All right. Um, just thinking that, um, and maybe we'll do this at some point. Um, we'll make it that you have to be logged on. I just don't want to mess with that today. That would have the advantage that, like, someone, if they were logged on, it would already bring up their customer information. And then you could ask them if they want to change it for this order. For example, my, uh, you know, my address is my address, but maybe I'd order a pizza from the place I want it uh, delivered to here, you know, or something like that. Or maybe I'm at a friend's house, and for this delivery, I want to deliver it somewhere else. All right. So I'm going to go in, and I'm going to create my details view. And of course, I can't see any of the items in the toolbox. So I'm going to close out of this and go back in.
go into design. I'm going into create my SQL data source, create my details view. All right, my SQL data source, configure data source, pizza connection string. Customer name, order type ID, time of order. I always like to go and put the custom in rather than using that. It's just it, you're used to, you know, once you get used to SQL, it's not that hard, and it gives you a little extra level of control. So I'm going to say select select so pizza order ID customer name order type ID I think I have a period instead of a comma I'll need to go and change that um, time of order from pizza order now remember this is going to be an ad page to add a new order All right. So this select statement really isn't going to do us anything because we're not going to be retrieving orders. We're going to go right into add mode for this. The one thing I forgot to do is I forgot to go into the um, order type table and add some fields in. So I'll do that in a minute. So my insert statement will be insert into pizza order, column names, <sighs> customer name, order type ID, Time of order, values, the three question marks. Test by query, doesn't show anything, but that's okay, there's nothing in that table. I'll click finish. I then go and bind this. To that data, uh, the, to the data source, and I say enable inserting, and I'm going to make the default the default um, mode to be insert. All right, so we go into insert mode automatically. Okay. Let's go into the database and add our order types because we need those, obviously. So, pick up delivery. All right, let's go and run this. I'm going to set add pizza to be my, no, I'm not. I'm going to set order to be my start page. That's a good thing to do like when you're testing, right? Um, because uh, when you're testing, um, typically you have pages that you've already finished that you don't work, blah, blah, blah. There's a new page that you're working on and you want to go directly to that. All right, so I'm going to go into this. We're 
far from done on this order, uh, add mode, right? Because there's a lot of things we haven't done yet. But I can at least check to see if this worked this far. So customer name, Mike. Order type ID. I have to type in a one or a two there, right? That's probably something we want to change, right? Because how are our customers going to know what the proper order type ID is, you know? So we make a mental note. We have to change. Time of order. Gee, the user shouldn't have to enter this in, right? But we'll make a mental note that this is something I'll have to change. We'll have to change. So I'll put in the date. I click insert and all right I think it worked I don't know if it worked all right how am I going to know it worked well there's a few different ways I'm going to go in and look in the database is there now something in the order table there it is so it worked all right now that certainly is a clunky way to do this, right? We're going to want to send this page somewhere else after we're done. All right? Uh, where we send it to might depend on a, a number of things. Um, for now, this is just temporarily, for now I'm going to send it to a page that contains a list of orders. Just so that I can verify that it worked. All right? So, I'm going to go and I'm going to create real quick this isn't like the permanent solution, but as a temporary solution, I'm going to send it to a page that has orders. This would be maybe if this was something where we entered all the orders, uh, if employees entered all the orders. Maybe after done entering an order, we see a list of orders. All right, so I'm going to go create another page. Call order list. I'll put a grid view, put a SQL data source, <coughs> configure data source. Select everything for pizza order. And then I'll bind this. Okay. Remember, this is just a sort of a temporary measure. All right. We don't ultimately want this to be like that. Okay. So go run this again. We'll do this again. Oops. Insert. Well, it didn't send it that page. Why? Because we didn't code it. Where do we put the code to send it to the page after a successful insert? It's in the .cs file. Okay. It's important to know to identify that this isn't something that's part of the ASPX file. The ASPX file really is the components in the interface, but it's something in the CS file. <coughs> Specifically, where do we put it in the CS file? Any thoughts? After inserted. After inserted, right. Uh, you, you can almost like talk it through and think like when do you want to have this done? I want this done after the order got inserted into the database. Well, what what things do I remember that had the word inserted into it? Well, there are events. There's two events on the 
on the, on the details view, item insert ting and item insert tid. So the item insert tid is after it does it. So yeah, after it's inserted, that's probably why I want to put the code. So I'll go in here. And with the details view, it's important to do this because I want this associated with that grid view. So I type in on. Oh, I'm sorry, not grid view, but detail view. On. And we have a whole list of things that we could do. And I'll say on item inserted equals. Now, we're probably going to, we don't want to do the page load code when the item's inserted. That doesn't make sense. We want to create a new event. So I'll create a new event. And it calls it details view one item inserted. All right. Generally, it's good to keep that name because that pretty well says exactly when that event's going to fire off. I can now go in here, and that event will be there, and I can do what I want to do. So I can say response dot redirect, and I can send it to the order list. I'm going to put a link on the order list page back to the order page. don't want to get in and out of Visual Studio all the time, you can always go to code view and type that in. Navigate URL equals order.aspx. All right. So now we can go and run this. example of going the extra mile, which again, I don't always do in class, which I apologize for, but sometimes under time constraints is better for me. I've shown you how to do this once, uh, but I should change these column names, right? Those look like database column <coughs> names, all right? So I should make those look better. So insert, um, so I want, to, I want to put in the name of the person that ordered this. Robert to time of order. I click insert. It takes me to the, the list of pizzas. And I can click order new pizza and I'm back and I can order enter the next order. Alright? So we're moving in the right direction. However, a few things. What if I put in a goofy value for this? Or a goofy value for that? All right. What's going to happen? Nothing good is going to happen here, right? All right. We know that. There's at least two things wrong. In fact, 
let's go for the gold and we'll make three things wrong. All right, what is wrong with this? Why won't this save? This won't save because number one, customer names required, I don't have it. Right. What's the order ID? What's wrong with the order ID? Yeah, it doesn't, 222 doesn't match anything in the database table. There's only one and two in the database table. So therefore, that's a database constraint. And finally, time for order, whatever I typed in there is not a date. All right? So what happens when I click insert? Well, I know nothing good's going to happen, but let's see specifically what happens. doing but it ain't good right oh what did it do it redirected me back to the list all right why well because that's the code I put in there to redirect it back to the list is that what I want to have happen no what would I want to have happen what would you want to have happen in the case of you entering this data I want to know why it didn't work. Okay, so what can we do? What are some of the things that we can do to make this work the way that we want to? Validation. We can put validation in. So we can put validation in for customer name, right? That's simply a required field validator. All right? We can put Time of order, we could put validation in for that. What validator or validators would we use to validate the time, the date of the order or the time of the order? Two of them, right? There's going to be a required field validator and there's going to be a compare validator to make sure that we put in a date time. All right? Because remember, each one does its own thing. Are we going to validate order type ID? You have to make sure something's selected. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. You're right. We want to do something with data type ID. I guess my question is, is do we want to, to put a validator for it, or do we want to handle this in some other way? What would you want to have happen? You eventually want to make it a drop down, right? You want to make it a drop down. All right? So, yes, you want to make it a drop down. So, all three of these things require us to make what out of these columns? Everyone sit perfectly still so you don't so I don't think that you're raising your hand or anything. And don't make any sounds. Template column. A template column, right? Because this is the out-of-the-box behavior. <laughs> Alright? This is the out-of-the-box behavior. And we don't want it the out-of-the-box behavior. We want to put a validator on this, put two validators on this. Change this from a text box to a drop down. Okay? So we want to do something different than the default behavior for these columns. Add validator, add two validators, <coughs> make this a drop down. Instantly, that should tell you we want a template column for each of them. Now, there's one more, one other thing that we want to do, right? Those will catch most of the probable problems, all right? If we put validators in, we make that a drop-down. That will, that will catch most of the probable problems, all right? 
However, there's always the oddball problem, right? Something that we hadn't counted on, all right? Someone's not connected, the database is blown up, or um, someone's maintaining the database and has it open exclusively. Those are things we can't put a validator for. We can't necessarily even code. What will we do for those kinds of unexpected problems? How do we handle the problems that we know are possible, but are not really preventable? That's probably a good way to put it. We can prevent them trying to save something without a customer name or time of order or the wrong data type for time of order. We can prevent that from happening by putting our validator controls in. And as long as there ain't a bug in those controls, we have prevented that problem from happening. All right? If we make a drop down, we have prevented that problem from happening, again, in the vast majority of cases. It would be a real fluke that there would be a problem with it, a bug in the validator or some weird database occurrence. However, there are certain errors that we know are possible, but we can't prevent. We can't prevent someone going in right now if this database was, let's say, on a shared drive, we can't prohibit someone from right now going in and edit that order table and have it open exclusively. So what do we do for the problems that we can't prevent? Do a try-catch. Do a try-catch. We, try, we, we can't prevent them, but we can handle them. And we can handle them gracefully instead of just blowing up. All right? Um, I had a little bit of a late start today, and I don't want to cut into your lab time. So we'll end here. On Tuesday, we'll clean this up and make it work. Right. Yes? Could we, instead of using two, I know this is something we can talk about Tuesday, but in, on, instead of using two validations for a time of order, could we just make that like it were automatically time stamps when you right. insert? Th that'll be phase two. Okay. Yeah, that'll, that'll definitely be phase two. In fact, that doesn't even really need to be visible, right? You shouldn't expect someone to have to type that in. That should be automatically set and even automatically set and not even, like, visible. I mean, I guess we could put that on there, but, you know, we wouldn't really, even really need to show that to the user. Yeah, we'll definitely get that on Tuesday, and we can definitely do that.